This is part two of the lecture on postoperative findings in the skull base. If you haven't heard part one, this one's not going to make a lot of sense. We've already been discussing early complications of skull base surgery, and we've gone through this half of the list, talking about flaps and flap failure, then hematoma stroke, cranial nerve injury, and infection. So let's move on now to the other half of the list, starting with arterial injuries. Arterial injury. Uh, we worry about dissections of an artery, direct surgical injuries. Um, they, are, they take great pains. The neurosurgeons take great pains to avoid arterial injury. They will abandon a surgery and leave tumor behind if they are worried that it is too tightly adherent to, a, um, to, a, to an artery or is encasing the artery. So they really go out of their way. Thankfully, these are rare. Uh, this is an example of a postoperative thrombus in the middle of the internal carotid artery. How about venous thrombosis? Well, if you're doing a skull base surgery, anterior skull base surgery, you're going to be worried about the cavernous sinus. Here's an example of flow in the left cavernous sinus and no flow in the right cavernous sinus. That in and of itself is not enough to make the diagnosis because people are asymmetric and make it earlier flow into one sinus versus the other. But the expansion of the cavernous sinus here, that's a really important clue. And uh, I have to admit the gas locule also a super important clue. Uh, one of the things you should be looking for is injection of the fat in the orbit. There should be small linear areas of additional edema tracking through the orbit when you have a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Another example of a cavernous sinus thrombosis, this time on MRI, perhaps the injection, the venous stasis of the uh, orbit is a little more evident on this, uh, on this example. Um, and you can see that there are linear areas of non-filling around the periphery of the cavernous sinus there. Another example of cavernous sinus thrombosis showing another important secondary sign, which is enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein. There's the normal superior ophthalmic vein enhancing normal size. Here is the affected superior ophthalmic vein enlarged, non-enhancing, and again, the injection through the fat planes of the orbit. If you are doing posterior skull base surgery, then you're going to be worried about sigmoid sinus thrombosis. Uh, you can see this asymmetry here with flow through the uh, sigmoid sinus on the left and a lack of flow on the right uh, on the same side where the surgery has occurred. Pneumocephalus. All of these patients are going to have a small amount of pneumocephalus after their surgery. It's inevitable. When do you become concerned about pneumocephalus? Well, you become concerned when there is a massive amount of pneumocephalus or when you get a tension pneumocephalus. How do you tell the difference between a tension and pneumocephalus? One thing you can look for is a distortion of the frontal lobe. If the frontal lobe seems like it is pressed in and it is no longer convex, convex like it's supposed to be, you can suspect a pneumocephalus. Now, you are not going to be definitive about that diagnosis. Tension pneumocephalus is not necessarily present based on radiologic findings alone. There is a whole clinical picture that goes with it, so you can suggest the diagnosis of tension pneumocephalus, call the neurosurgeon, have a conversation about the patient, but uh, realize that you cannot be definitive in most cases. Now, it's not usually the amount of pneumocephalus that is the problem. It is whether the pneumocephalus is getting better or worse. You should never have more gas than you had yesterday. It should always go in a decreasing direction. And once you've documented that over about a week, people start to relax a little bit. Um, if you do see increasing pneumocephalus, that indicates a continued communication, a failure of the flap reconstruction, a leak. It's a leak of gas in, usually accompanied by a leak of CSF out. Plain films are perfectly good for following pneumocephalus. You don't need a CT of the head. You can get a, uh, a lateral supine uh, uh, x-ray of the head and uh, follow the pneumocephalus as it gets better day by day. Okay, this is a patient who's undergone an expanded endonasal approach surgery. Nice flap reconstruction there. What's wrong with this midline post-contrast T1-weighted image? 
Well, the, the, the title is probably going to give you a little bit of a clue. Uh, the problem here is that there's no enhancement of the infundibulum. If you look carefully, you can see the non-enhancing infundibulum. That's a problem. The infundibulum has been injured. The vascular supply to the infundibulum has been injured. Uh, when you injure the infundibulum, sometimes there is a non-enhancing remnant there. Sometimes it's just gone, it's surgically, or uh, injured by the tumor, more commonly injured by the tumor itself. Uh, the results of these are various, diabetes insipidus, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Um, usually the endocrine manifestations uh, the lack of pituitary function can be managed with uh, endocrine replacement therapy. It's really those first two, the diabetes insipidus and the SIADH, that are the most concerning findings in, in pituitary dysfunction. Pseudomeningocele. Pseudomeningocele are common and they usually go away. So why do I call this a pseudomeningocele instead of a meningocele? It's a meningocele if the meninges themselves bulge out through the defect. But if the meninges just get torn and the CSF leaks out through the defect to be contained by the surrounding soft tissues, that is a pseudomeningocele. These are very common in the posterior fossa, suboccipital um, uh, uh, defects, uh, very common to have some amount of pseudomeningocele. The size and the presence of symptoms are what determine whether it needs to be corrected. Pseudomeningoceles that occur uh, on anterior skull base surgeries tend to be more concerning. Okay, we've gone through our list of early complications. Let's talk about potential late complications from skull base surgery. In late in the late period, we're worried about recurrence. And we're also worried about a special kind of recurrence where we seed along the surgical tract. Flap failure is still a problem. We've gone over sort of the findings of that already, but it remains a problem even late. We start to worry about the formation of encephaloceles. Usually it's just CSF leaking out early, but if the meninges, if you get form a meningocele, uh, late you can start to get an encephaloceles. Again, infection, just always a problem for us, even when we're out of the stage where leak is a, a common problem, uh, infection remains a problem for us. We've already talked about that. Mucoseal formation, if you dealt with a sinus or uh, any of the air pockets. Uh, nasal symptoms, we'll talk more about that usually not a lot of findings, but can be very concerning clinically. Arachnoid webs or synechiae or scarring, whatever you want to call these, um, can be very uh, difficult, particularly after Chiari decompression, where they may obstruct flow out through the foramen of Magendi. And even though the patient appears to have a beautiful um, uh, decompression, they may have recurrence of their symptoms because of this scarring. Encephalomalacia, uh, you all know what that looks like radiologically. Logically, and radiation necrosis as well. This may not be a complication of the surgery, but it is still a big concern of the surgeons, and you're going to be looking for that on these studies, so might as well talk about it now. Recurrence. Certainly, one worries about recurrence at the site of the surgery, at the site of the tumor, and a lot of our surveillance imaging is focused on finding that recurrence. This is a recurrent chordoma uh, where the surgery was performed. But you also have to worry about seeding, tumor seeding along the surgical tract. For example, this recurrence that seeded along the track of this expanded endonasal approach, right? So this is metastatic chordoma seeded along the surgical tract, as well as a recurrence at the primary site. It is very important to image the entirety of the the area that w underwent surgery in order to ensure that you don't overlook seating. Uh, this, uh, this is a great case because it has both, and it was pointed out to me by my colleague, Katie Trailer. It's a great case. Uh, encephaloceles. Encephaloceles usually are the result of flap failure. You get displacement of the flap, and the brain can fall out through the hole. Um, this is worrisome in the posterior fossa and also along the anterior skull base. Uh, you can get uh, uh, Meckel's cave encephaloceles. You can get encephaloceles through the Tegman tympani. So really any of the areas of skull base, this can become a problem if your reconstruction fails. Um, there are a lot of important findings. Here's 
I mean, in this example, it's obvious that the brain is 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 just headed out through that the defect and, and into the nasal cavity. Sometimes it can be more subtle. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish herniated brain from just a little bit of debris with along the surgical tract. Um, there are clues to look for, such as expansion of the sulci uh, adjacent to the area of herniation. Meningocele's. Uh, if you don't take brain tissue with you and you just have the meninges go through the gap, then this is a potential problem. You can see a nice, uh, a nice flap reconstruction here, but unfortunately, uh, a little further back along the surgical tract, there is a meningocele rising out of Meckel's cave. Mucoceles. Anytime you mess with a sinus, there's a good chance that you're going to have problems with outflow afterwards, and you'll retain mucus, and that entire air cell will begin to expand. This is not a mucus retention cyst. This is not just one blocked mucus gland. This is an entire air cell that cannot drain the mucus and starts to expand, remodels the walls of the sinus smoothly, takes on a spherical configuration, and this can cause problems problems throughout the sinuses. Nasal symptoms. Patients with nasal symptoms usually don't have radiologic findings, but this can be very troublesome to the surgeons. Uh, excessive crusting, that is, these patients never fully heal in the, throughout their nose. Uh, loss of smell and, and thus taste is a, is, is a devastating long-term complication. And then empty nose syndrome. What's empty nose syndrome? It turns out that your sense you are breathing depends on the rush of air across your nasal mucosa. If too much of the nasal mucosa is removed as part of an anterior skull base surgery, you lose your sense that you are breathing. You're still moving air in and out, but you can't tell that you are breathing. It's extremely disturbing to patients. So we want to leave enough uh, nasal mucosa behind that patients can feel the air moving through their nose. Encephalomalacia, you know what encephalomalacia looks like. I'm not going to show you pictures of encephalomalacia, but understand that the clinical manif manifestations are psychiatric, particularly if there is frontal lobe encephalomalacia, and seizures anytime you injure brain tissue. Of course, it's a potential nidus for seizure. Radiation necrosis. Although not strictly a surgical complication, it's a radiation complication, it's something you're going to see on all of these patients. It's worth talking about. Um, there are some subtle clues that will help you distinguish radiation necrosis from recurrent tumor, which is the other enhancing thing. I mean, you can certainly uh, go to more advanced techniques like perfusion or SPECT or, or PET to distinguish radiation necrosis from recurrent tumor, but there are also clues on post-contrast MRI, the hazy margin and the character and the spread uh, are all clues that can help you to distinguish radiation necrosis from tumor, but it is one of the most difficult things that we deal with in neuroradiology. So that's a review of early and late potential complications after surgery to the anterior central and posterior skull base.